So I wonder if maybe 100 years ago, during like the horse and buggy era, they were asking questions, should we fear automobiles? And then maybe 20, 25 years ago, the people at the telegram companies, they were asking, should we fear the internet? And I wonder if now, if we look at what automation is doing and say AI, those same questions are coming up. Should we fear it or should we be looking at how maybe these are changing things? So what's your position on this, Ajahn? Right. Um, well, I, I think the question is more like, you know, should we always fear technology? Uh, should all technology be feared? Or is there something specific about robotics and AI that we should, in particular, pay attention to? Um, do, you, do you think it's kind of a visceral response from people just that, I guess, that intelligence, even the word artificial intelligence, what, what do you think is maybe kind of the, the anxiety that it produces within some, some people? What, what do you think that's coming from? Well, in terms of public perception, I think there's a healthy dose of different media coverages about technology, this and that, how technology is impacting our society. Sometimes good, but more often than not, we see these scary stories of how things have gone wrong. Um, I think our, our concerns are fed by these types of media coverages, uh, but in a, in a, there is rationale behind that, which is that you know, AI is a type of technology that is very unique in that it actually interfaces with how we make decisions. It has the power to influence our decisions, for example. Uh, same thing for robotics. So I think there's a, a healthy reason to think that, yeah, maybe we should be uh, fearing, not, not quite fearing, but uh, be more concerned or thoughtful about how we go ahead with this particular type of te technology. You brought up media coverage, so maybe I'm part of <laughs> the a issue journalist. here. But um, I'm thinking about a story that came out last week where Google, they were displaying their new duplex feature for the system. Uh, did anybody guys uh, out there follow this story with the, yeah, I see some hands up. And for those who don't know, it's this feature on the Google Assistant where it imitates you know, human speech so well, it inserts the ums and the ahs that you wouldn't necessarily know if you're on the phone with this assistant that you're actually speaking to a robot or to AI. And so that brought up a lot of questions about ethics, about how you know, people should be informed about what they're dealing with this. What was your reaction to, I guess, the media coverage or just the core issue? Because Google did come out and eventually, after many, many days, saying, oh no, people will be informed that they are speaking to AI or, or robots or what have you. What's your position on something like this, Ajahn? Um, my first reaction, uh, as, as somebody who does AI ethics assessments for a living, <laughs> was I want to do an AI ethics assessment on this. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I think there is there is definitely a, a, a layer of issues around the notion of transparency. Um, not only not only have I seen a lot of public pushback because of the fact that the technology seems to work so well that there is this uncanny valley of, oh, I can't tell the difference between whether this is a human speaking or whether this is AI speaking. Um, there are all these different questions about, should the AI identify itself when it calls a particular restaurant to make an appointment on behalf of a human? Um, so I think there are, there are transparency issues that really needs to be figured out, and I would be a proponent of actually looking at what layers of different transparency should be there in terms of you know, what's the ultimate objective of these types of technology in the first place? And does it defeat the purpose if an AI like that were to declare itself and say, um, I'm calling on behalf of Ajang <laughs> as a digital assistant, uh, and I would like to make a, an appointment, in which case maybe, maybe the person on the other side of the phone may say, well, I don't want to talk to an AI, but I don't want to lose my business either. Do I have a say in this? Yeah. Well, and you're touching on something I think is very important here, which is you know transparency as well as the whole fairness of what's going on here, as well as just tell me a little bit about what you're doing at Generation R Consulting. You're CEO there, and you're doing these you know uh, ethical assessments. Uh, tell me, is there ever going to be such thing as a one size fits all solution to right. what's going on with a lot of these things? Right, so uh, Generation R is a, a brand new type of consultancy that we started about a year ago um, as a spin-off from Open Robo Ethics Institute, which has been around for, for much longer. Um, and we started the company because we've realized that there isn't really a good one-size-fits-all solution to the ethical and societal uh, issues that we're facing with AI and robotics technologies. And one of the reasons for that is because 
not only is it incredibly hard to find these top three principles, if you will, that is able to apply to all the technologies and all application domains that actually make sense. Um, there's actually a lot of different things you can learn about a specific piece of technology and its impact when you delve really deeply into, into um, the use case of the technology itself. So um, at Generation R, we, we are a team of three uh, with engineering background, expert in uh, design theory as well as ethics to take a look at, okay, um, you, company A, are trying to build an AI system for your, your business. Can we come in and provide you with our expertise to be able to foresee what could possibly go wrong? What are some of the key ethical insights you should have moving forward so that it's not that you create an AI system to be the most efficient company in the world, but actually, you have clear objectives and clear ideas of what type of values are being pl placed into that, that system so that the designers can make decisions that are informative and aligned with human values, that may be the user's values and that of the organization. Um, business leaders are able to actually communicate about how their decisions may be affecting uh, AI system in, in that company. So, I mean, one of the interesting things that you guys have been able to do is partner with an organization like Technical Safety BC. Could you maybe uh, talk a little bit about that example there and maybe inform us whether that may be a typical or an atypical example of what you guys would be doing? Sure. Um, it's atypical in, in, the, in the sense that there hasn't been a, a company in the world that has a comprehensive ethics assessment of their AI program uh, out in the open, like Technical Safety BC actually does. So it's the first company in the world uh, that I know of that does that. Um, Technical Safety BC is a, is a local company uh, that, that provides safety, safety oversight uh, to make sure that elevators don't fall down the sky uh, in, in BC, for example. Uh, they cover many different technologies. Um, and with the leadership of Catherine Room, the CEO, the project they, were, they, they launched fairly recently is to take a look at different types of data they were collecting as a safety authority in BC to see if they can create a machine learning system that is able to predict where they should be uh, sending their safety officers to prevent certain safety hazards, for example. So if you take a look at the intention of that particular project, you know, uh, keeping the public safe and creating a better way to do that. That, that sounds like a, a fairly good purpose, right? Why would you need an ethics assessment to do that? Um, so Generation R actually worked with Technical Safety BC to create that roadmap, um, in part because we've realized that when you have an AI system, regardless of your intentions for that particular project, you have things like data bias you need to think about. Where is your data coming from? How is that interacting with people? Do you have enough policies in place to be able to support that system in the first place? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, to be able to look at uh, even ideas about fairness. You know? um, is this particular AI system serving a particular definition of fairness? Even those kind of questions were really relevant. Um, so you know, uh, we, we were able to take a look at not only the issues that, that may be customized and very relevant to that particular project, but we were able to convert that into action items that business can use today. Well, tell me, you know, from your perspective as a roboethicist, you know, with, with regards to the biases that can develop here, why do we need to be, I don't want to say cracking down on it, but why do we have to be very observant and very careful about the biases that can develop as we look at these technologies? Right. Um, one of the easiest uh, uh, place that I can point to is the fact that when we talk about AI, most of the times we are talking about machine learning, which is, which is dependent on what, what kind of patterns are we able to find from data. Now, we sometimes have this stereotype notion that data is this objective thing, that it's, it's going to give us the most scientific facts about the world. Um, when, when you actually drill down into it, often that data is provided by humans, and humans have our own biases. And so if we are not careful about what kind of human biases we actually have in that data, then we, will be, we won't be um, creating a future that we actually want in a predictive manner. 
we will actually actively be looking at the patterns of the past and recycling it or regurgitating it for the future. Uh, and that can happen without us knowing about it if we're not too careful. So I think just recently, let's look at the Cambridge Analytica you know, scandal that erupted. And it brought up a lot of questions about whether we should have regulations, whether legislation should be passed in order to just be watching what these giant tech companies are doing. Are you getting a sense that this will eventually be the case when we look at how automation is changing things, when we look at how artificial intelligence is influencing the workforce? Do you think that legislature, legislators are eventually going to get on board with pushing forward with legislation? What's your focus right now, Ajahn? I think that's already happening. I think regulars, regulators are incredibly interested in how can we even regulate these types of technologies in the first place. And uh, there are many discussions uh, globally where I am actually being engaged to, to talk about what are some of the effective policies we, we should be talking about. Now, um, things like GDPR, some of you may be aware of. It's a, it's a new privacy law in, in, uh, in the EU. Um, that is specifically looking at data and, and, and our rights with respect to our, our data. That's a regulatory system. And there are many data scientists that I know who are supportive of having that kind of regula regulation in Canada as well. Um, so I think there is a trend for, for regulation there, but I think Something to note about regulation is that we can't capture all the things that can go wrong with AI and robotic systems um, by just following regulation. Uh, I think due diligence has a lot more to cover on top of that. Well, do you think that there needs to be flexibility if and when legislation passes? Because, you know, I find government and maybe legislation can often be slow to react to things, whereas you look at the pace at which technology is moving, it's very swift. Does there need to be a certain level of flexibility in order for any legislation, any regulations to be effective here? Um, yes. <laughs> I kind of led you into that answer. Well, actually, yeah, yeah. But I, um, I think of the, the kind of work that we do as Generation R to be an enabler for companies so that you can self-regulate. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a way for us to be innovative without being over-regulated by a, a more abstract governing bodies. Um, if you're able to look at what is the right direction for a particular project and be able to monitor your own projects, um, then I think that that in itself will allow regulate regulatory bodies to stay at a specific level without interrupting or hindering the innovation uh, process. So when you say self-regulate, are, are we thinking yeah. the industry self-regulating itself or individual companies, individual firms self-regulating? A little bit of both. Okay. I, I would say, you know, uh, individual companies are probably the most flexible and lean ways to do it. Uh, but I can also envision different sectors uh, arranging themselves as coalitions of, of uh, industries to develop a standard for themselves uh, be because there may be needs to. So what happens then if you get that one bad apple, that one Cambridge Analytica that kind of blows everything up then? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a tricky question. I, I think when those things happen, there's always that inclination to have more regulation so that those things will never happen. Uh, but I, I, I like to think of it as a balance of risk, right? Cambridge Analytica is a huge, huge deal because the kind of risk that we, uh, we were facing is, is huge. Uh, but it's not going to be the case for every single application domain that we can talk about. Uh, so perhaps certain things should be regulated so that we make sure that we don't run certain risks that we as a society decide it's, it's simply too much. So not too long ago, uh, last year, you were able to speak to a Senate committee here in Canada, mm -hmm. and you had you know, senators, they, they were picking your brain. They wanted to know what your thoughts were. How responsive do you find Canadian politicians? How on the ball are they? Aware are they of what's going on here? And, and what do you envision? You, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but what do you envision maybe on a global scale with regards to kind of the future of regulation and legislation, perhaps? Um, I was, I was pleasantly surprised last year uh, by how many times I actually flew to Ottawa to talk to the Senate, <laughs> um, in, in part because that was an indication of how 
how much effort is there from the Canadian government to actually look at AI and robotics as something that they should be focusing on, especially from the ethics portion of it. Um, but I, I do think we're, we're quite behind in terms of the discussion portion of it, in part because Previously, we've, we have really benefited from the, the United States and their efforts in leading this type of discussions. I think there, there really has to be a lot more efforts from the Canadian side to show leadership in how can we actually re regulate these technologies better, and also being able to demonstrate what are some of the Canadian values we can incorporate into our policies that we can actually set as an example internationally. Is there a jurisdiction in the world that is kind of leading the way right now? Who would you point to as maybe somebody that Canada could take some lessons from at this moment? Um, I, I've mentioned GDPR from the uh, European Union. Uh, yeah. That's an easy one to point at just because their regulatory system is, is quite different uh, and they can cross borders much much easier than you know Canadian government and, and having any kind of uh, synergies with, with our uh, neighbors. Um, but I, I think there's uh, privacy is definitely one of those items that we care deeply about because we're much more aware of the implications of it. But in terms of different aspects of the data-driven technologies we can talk, talk about, in terms of bias that we talked about, um, fairness, transparency issues, I think those are the things that Canadian government, uh, I'm hoping, will be able to lead a little bit more. So let's bring it right back around to the start of this. Um, Ajung. Should we fear the robots? <laughs> um, yes and no. <laughs> One of those tricky, tricky answers. I think, yes, we should fear robots that are not necessarily designed with thoughtful design decisions. Um, yes, we should fear robotics and AI systems that, uh, that, from the design perspective, aren't supported in terms of what are some of the human values that should be in play when you make decisions that impact everybody. Because, you know, tell you what, um, something that is really interesting about AI is one designer can make a decision and that'll become, quote unquote, policy or the role for everybody, all of the users. Are the engineers or data scientists actually trained to be policy makers? Not really, not often anyway, it's not that I know of. Um, so, in that sense, I think we should definitely have a healthy dose of concern in terms of how are we supporting our engineers and designers to make the right decisions going forward. But no, in the sense that I don't think we will have Terminator robots that'll just be out and about in you know um, our streets in Vancouver to, to kill everybody. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is a healthy balance and I think we're we are leading the way forward with, uh, with this discussion. Okay, but if those Terminator robots come, I'm giving you a phone call and I am complaining that you did not give me fair warning. I'll put you on my uh, contact list. Okay, fair enough. But Lock number, no kidding. Ajung, thank you so much for uh, taking the time here. Thank you.